Be Wealthy and Smart, episode 169. into a world of wealth and financial freedom without budgets, boredom, or bosses on Be Wealthy and Smart. And now, here's your host, Linda P. Jones. Welcome to Be Wealthy and Smart. I'm Linda P. Jones, America's Wealth Mentor, empowering women and men worldwide to financial freedom. Have you checked out the Creating Wealth podcast yet? Listen to Jason Hartman's latest episode about nominal dollars versus real dollars and understanding investor psychology. If you like this podcast, you'll like his too. And now for part two of our interview with Jason Van Orden. Do people feel uncomfortable putting themselves out there? How do you help them get over that? Yeah, I mean, that, like I mentioned to you, one of the beginning pieces to making an impact on the world is you have to believe that you actually have value to offer. And, you know, there's there's natural points at which we have this doubt spring up. And, you know, it's still even doing this online for 12 years, it still springs up for me at times. Um, and it, one thing that it's referred to as is imposter syndrome or imposter phenomenon or imposterism. And that is the definition of it is that it's the you doubt your own skills or ability you know you have a lack of confidence even in light of evidence to the contrary in light of evidence that you do have so it, you know we convince ourselves that we got the job because we got lucky we got the clients because we just happen to have good people skills we have or you know somehow we've pulled the wool over people's eyes and at any point they're going to figure us out Right, and if you just Google imposter syndrome, you're going to find all all kinds of great articles about this. And so, just know that it's a thing, and a lot of people um, deal with it. And so, I think one of the important um, ways to start realizing the value that you do have to offer is there, there's a wonderful quote by Seth Godin, and it, it's something like I, I'm not going to get it word for word, but it's your generosity is more important than your perfection. And sometimes that's the worry is we want to be beyond reproach or we want to have, you know, I know with me, like I get this thing where it's like, well, I want my work to be so undeniably like the best stuff out there that then I hold myself to, uh, you know, just a impractical level that it can hold me back from actually releasing things and putting it out there in a timely manner. And so it's just to start being really generous with your, um, you know, with your knowledge and with your insights and with uh, the, the process that you've developed. And that might be through the content that you put out there. It might be actually getting on. I mean, one thing that I do to help get it when I do have those moments of doubt is I get on the phone with somebody, maybe it's a past client, maybe it's a current client, maybe it's somebody in a uh, connected with through, through Facebook. And, you know, I know that they're an avatar of mine. That's, you know, a word that you hear used to, to describe your ideal client. So it's the kind of person I would want to work with. And, you know, I just get on the phone and start asking them lots of questions about, you know, hey, what, what, what are your most important goals over the next six months? What are your biggest challenges when it comes to reaching those goals? What have you tried so far? What would it mean to you to overcome those things? And then I'll start offering a few insights. And that kind of starts pulling me a bit out of my own, um, you know, inward gazing of like, am I good enough? And not that it's going to necessarily just erase the imposter syndrome, but I don't think I've ever gotten off one of those calls without feeling like, dang, man, I do have a lot to offer like because you see the person responding to the stuff you're giving them and you get off there feeling like wow i just helped somebody and so i'll do that like right before writing copy for you know a a sales promo (laughs) or i'll do that when i'm maybe about to outline a new product or something it just gets me jazzed and excited to like go and do more of that um so you know find an opportunity to be generous is one of many ways to overcome to help you overcome imposter syndrome the second quick tip I can give is, you know, log your successes. Keep, you know, sit down and think about as many times as you can where somebody's told you like, wow, that was really helpful. Or you know that you, you gave your best work and you delivered and really helped move somebody forward. Um, when you get those emails, 
that are thanking you, when you get those customer testimonials, when somebody tells you, I mean, look, like you said at the beginning of this call, you said some very nice things. And I'll tell you, like, I have a problem sometimes not taking that in and allowing that in. That's imposter syndrome. It's very easy to just go like, oh, that's a nice of you to say, but kind of in the back of my mind, dismiss it. Right. Yeah. So it's like, look, make a deliberate habit out of keeping that stuff and logging and looking at it and taking it in and going like, look, look, this is an email of somebody like I impacted their life. And remember that when you do have that opportunity. And so know that your generosity and the people that you yet have to serve out there in the world, that's more important than you looking flawless all the time or feeling perfectly qualified all the time or whatever, you know, that might be. So um, there's a few insights that I can give about believing in yourself. I like that. I think that, you know, we're just not used to taking all those compliments in and getting feedback like that. And when you're out in the internet space, you're out in your business space, you're going to get a lot of feedback. And, you know, one thing that's been interesting is just seeing uh, TV shows and how people get haters on TV shows. And it's really interesting, but they say you're not successful until you get some haters. And none of us want that. But on the other hand, if you change your, your thoughts about that, um, maybe you're standing out and being different. You're being a little controversial. You know, a lot of people find great success in that controversy. You're talking about maybe just pulling out one little detail, but maybe your brand becomes so different and so detailed that you're completely different than a lot of other people and you seem somewhat controversial. Have you ever seen that happen? Uh, yeah, it's, you know, that is one way to cut through and stand out. Um, I mean, I, you know, there's people who's, okay, so here's an important insight too, is I, I see a lot of people and, and I'll, I'll, you know, this will come back around to answering your question, but I see a lot of people who, you know, they, maybe they see somebody that they really look up to. Maybe they see somebody who is a bit of an online hero and they love their brand and, uh, you know, somebody has impacted them. And so then they start kind of assuming, well, in order to grow to that level and be that kind of influencer, I need to do things in the same way. Um, let's take Gary Vee because a lot of people know Gary V. Um, he has a very distinct personality and the way that he goes about things. Um, and for anyone who doesn't know, that's Gary Vaynerchuk. Gary Vaynerchuk. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, from wine library TV and then became very popular in social media and is just like speaker, author, very influential guy in business and entrepreneurship. And, uh, I mean, he's from New Jersey, no nonsense attitude. And just like, he is known for saying it like it is and not backing down. Um, his energy is not my energy. I mean, I respect the guy I've read his books. I, I don't, I often don't find myself listening to or watching his videos just because it doesn't, it doesn't work for me. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. Now, the point being there is I have discovered that, you know what, there's like a million ways to influence people and be an influencer and maybe five of them are wrong. So go find the one that works best for you. And we all have a different way of influencing. And I've tried before being the the really slick copywriter who writes just the right word phrase, you know, combination of phrases that can get convince somebody to buy something in five minutes. That's not me. It felt very wrong. And I, I had all kinds of consternation over writing emails for years until I finally figured out, you know what? I'm a teacher. I just need to teach and tell stories. And guess what? Like, it changed not only to make it easier for me to write emails, it actually worked better for me to focus on that. Um, I love the work of Sally Hogshead, who has something she calls the fascination advantage. You can take it and figure out what is your natural way of showing up in the world to influence and impact and fascinate and get attention and focus on that. Some people are naturally charismatic. Some people earn trust over time. Some people are like mysterious and have a mystique to them. So figure it out what it is for you. So coming back to controversial, you know, some people do that well. Some people, I mean, you know, look, it's in politics, it happens all the time where people come and say something very controversial in order to like get, you know, to, to get polarize people on their side and then eventually they'll come back to the middle because they like then they got to get everybody else on their side right and and being very changing like that it's hard for people to to trust you over time for one but it just feels very inauthentic for two so don't be controversial for controversial sake but at the same time don't don't be afraid to like take a stand and like like people want leadership if you have an opinion on something say it. If you stand against or for something, 
say it. And, you know, going back to saying the first step, you got to know who your audience is. You got to know who your audience isn't. And if you are whitewashing as to not offend people, then you are doing a great disservice to yourself as well as all those people that you can attract and can do wonderful work out there. So, you know, if you come out and just go, you know, I mean, I'll just stick again with the fitness thing because it's so easy. Like if you feel like paleo is just, you know, a big crock and it's like, I'm so tired of people thinking they can just drink heavy cream and eat bacon every day and that's going to make them healthy, like, <laughs> then say so, right? <laughs> like come out and say, look, here's seven reasons why paleo is actually doing a disservice to people. Fine. I mean, I'm not saying I believe that or not. I'm just saying you might believe that and don't be afraid to say that. So, because again, that's going to help you stand out. It'll feel more authentic. Maybe that'll feel controversial. Um, but do it when it feels authentic and it's, it's a position that you feel like you can really stand behind. Mm -hmm. I like that. And it, it, it does. It's like we get on these trains of trends and now that we are on this paleo trend and, you know, but somebody initiated that. Somebody started that. Somebody came right. up with the name paleo, you know, and all of a sudden everybody's jumped on the paleo thing, you mm -hmm. know. So, yeah, I totally agree that uh, it helps to stand out. It's not easy for people to get used to doing and putting themselves out there and, you know, they're just not used to being in front of crowds and having people listen to them and judge them and write about them and, you know, that kind of thing. But you get over that. Mm -hmm. Yep. So what else can they do for their long-term impact or long-term income? Well, there's, there's four areas that, I mean, I, because I love working with influencers, I love them helping them scale their impact and their income, you know, get to that six figure and even seven figure point, get to those big opportunities that they might, whether it's a bestseller or, you know, speaking on big stages. I, I and the internet allows a a path to get to those things. I've studied tons of self-made influencers in all kinds of different niches and markets and, and audiences. And, and I've boiled down to really there's, there's four key areas that, that these influencers are really solid on. And at, at each point when they're looking to grow to the next level, it's typically you come back to one of these areas that you need to refine and work on. Um, and, and in my experience, every business, every brand, um, every influencer is leaving money and impact on the table, so to speak, because there's, there's you know, low, low hanging fruit or opportunities. There's holes in the bucket that just need to be plugged and worked out in the right way. So this framework kind of helps you identify where the next best low hanging fruit is so you can get some of that income and impact and, and um, bring it into to your business. And number one is um, positioning. So they're very clear about their positioning. And this is everything that has to do with uh, what we talked about, identifying your audience, being very relevant and resonant with your messaging, um, knowing who you want to attract, who you don't want to attract, uh, getting the right authority and credibility markers to get increasingly bigger um, opportunities and to also increasingly attract more premium clients with ease. Um, so that's all the stuff in positioning that, that, which is a very broad area, but that's, you know, about elevating your brand and making it more clear as to who you are and what you offer. And there's always ways you can play around with and, and increase that. The second area to look at is in your platform. So we've got positioning and we have platform and that is being very strategic about what marketing and media channels you are using online or offline to grow your brand, to attract your audience, engage them, get them on your list, grow your brand, turn people into customers. And this is a place that people very easily overextend themselves thinking, well, if I'm showing up in a lot of places, I have greater chance of attracting my audience, but they end up spreading themselves too thin, not being strategic about it. And you know, they get lackluster results as opposed to choosing one or two strategic things that are going to serve them well, given their values, given their goals, given their audience and, and the message that they have to share and just doing them extremely well well. Maybe it's podcasting and Facebook. Maybe it's uh, YouTube videos and Facebook live. Maybe, you know, and again, there's a million combinations. Find the one that works for you. Don't just copy somebody else's. Um, so that's the second thing is, you know, you can look at your platform and, and either and, and refine and incrementally improve that to attract more people towards you and get more, more attention. Mm-hmm. The third place is the product offer and process. So this is knowing, again, your pro you know, refining more clearly the process that gets the result for the audience that you're serving. Or maybe you've done that really well in one area and now you're like, 
I've now identified this second area or this sub audience or this, you know, sidestep over here, a slightly different audience. And here's another process I can deliver to them. And so now I'm going to have a new product or a new, um, or, or it might be adding on a higher level product to one. So you've had clients that have been with you and now it's like, okay, once they've gone through my, um, you know, my lower end $500 product, now I've got like the $3,000 coaching package or, um, you know, or, or, or six month course experience or whatever. So building out your product offerings, your product suite, um, you know, again, to maximize the LTI lifetime income and impact for every single customer. And there's always more money to be made there by either restructuring, adding on to, or just putting together into a better system, your, your product offerings. And then the fourth area is just your marketing systems, looking at your business and going, where can I automate? Where can I streamline? Where can I get rid of stuff? Where can I um, outsource? Where can I build teams? So that, um, you know, the more you can focus on the stuff that you are really good at, your unique genius, like people like to say, um, you know, the more your business is going to grow. So you know, there's always this process of, of 80-20. It's like, okay, let's identify the 20% of stuff that's getting the 80% of the results and get rid of the rest. Okay, now let's do it again. Okay, now let's do it again. And that's how you incrementally grow your impact and income is by just refining those systems over and over and over again. So, you know, whether I'm working with a new client or on my own business, you know, at the beginning of a quarter, I'll go, let me look in those four areas and find the next piece of low hanging fruit. And then bam, it's about taking consistent action over the next 90 days in one of those areas to go, I, you know, in this one area, given this specific goal and this metric that I want to measure, I'm going to, I'm going to take my impact and income to the next level. Um, you know, so it, it might be adding on a new channel to your traffic. It might be launching a new product. It might be adding a new system. It might be hiring a new team member. It might be adding, refining your positioning by adding new credibility markers to your brand. Um, but that's, that's how you get consistent growth year after year to reach the six figure, the multiple six figure, and then the seventh, uh, then the seven figure level with your brand. I love the focusing on what works because I think sometimes we can forget to be analytical, um, and not look at those things as to what's really been working, what is the low-hanging fruit, what is the next step for us. Um, one last question. I know that uh, sometimes I find people struggle with asking for the higher prices, and I've encouraged people to price package and promote their way to high-end clients by creating a luxury brand. Love it. How do you talk with them about, you know, because it seems like they feel this dilemma, like, well, I really want to help people all around the world. I really want to make an impact, but then they also want to make a nice income and they need to leave a job and they have bills to pay and a mortgage to pay or things mm -hmm. like that. So how do you uh, talk with them about those two points where you can make a difference to the whole world, but you also can make a good living at it? Well, let's take the four point structure that I just gave those four areas of the business. And I can tell you how each of those helps you be more, be able to charge higher prices and feel good about it, you know, elevate your income and feel good about it and still actually expand and increase your impact. So positioning, the more you work on refining your positioning, getting very, very clear again about your audience, your relevance, your resonance, when we hone in on, and you like, when you have somebody come to you and they're like, you are exactly what I've been looking for. It's very easy. And you've identified something that they're actively looking for, you know, that, that's, that relates to a, um, a high-level uh, desire or pain for them. And you're giving them the exact kind of solution that they're ready and willing to pay for. That's where you can, A, do your best work. Because if you attracted the right people, I think too often we cast too wide of a net. We end up working with people that, you know, we can do okay work with, but we're not as excited to work with them. And that's eventually going to show in, in the results that we get. And we're kind of all over the place as opposed to really refining a specific um, a specific system framework. I like the word framework that we're delivering to people over and over and over again, and just making better and better and better with every client that we work with. So that's positioning and how it affects price. So get clear and, and more precise on that. And you can raise your prices and love the work more that you're doing. Now, what if you're worried about pricing yourself out of, well, okay. So and getting clear on your platform, the more that you're attracting traffic um, to yourself, the more that you can be choosy about who, um, 
about who you decide to do one-on-one work with and who you decide is just not the the right fit. One of the biggest things that sends us off working with non-ideal clients is we're just not bringing in enough leads. And that is probably because we haven't built out or been consistent enough with our, our marketing platform. Um, products and process. Now, this is a huge area where pricing comes in. And you know, if you have, you know, when I when I work with a client, we, we like to end up coming out with everything from. I, I like to co- help somebody come up with like even a one to one thousand ratio in their pricing. So that can mean, you know, everything from like the twenty five dollar all the way up to twenty five thousand dollar offering. And that again, it, when you've done that in the right way, now you uh, you had a way that everybody can self-select at the right level for them. If they're only ready to like dip a toe and see, and then all they can afford is your $25 ebook, fine. That's, you know, and you're able to help a lot more people because obviously you can sell as many ebooks as you possibly can without tapping out your own time. And then as people move up the scale and they're ready to spend more premium prices, they get more access to you. Now, if you want to feel like, hey, I'm not being, I don't want to be like too, I know some people are like, well, then am I only being too elite and only allowing people who can afford the 2000 the the 5000 $10,000, $25,000 level to work with me? Yeah, that's always sure, the fear. Yeah. That's always, if, like, mm-hmm. look, and, and if it's not, if it's not of enough in your mind to go, hey, I've got these other lower price things to serve other people, that's you know, fine. Have scholarships or sliding scale, but um, also realize that I think when you focus on maximizing LTI, lifetime income and lifetime impact, and it's two sides of one coin because it's not just about let me leech as much money out of every customer as possible. It's like, look, the more money people spend with you, it's just kind of a law of nature. The more impact you end up having on their lives, that's right. not only because of an in, uh, in, um, commitment level that they have. I mean, that's a big part of it, but there's just a, a mental money uh, psychology and mindset to it as well. Um, and then the more that you, the fourth area is like that, that progression of marketing systems that you move people through, um, you know, it allows people to kind of stair step themselves up. They dip their toe in with the $25 offer and they get some results out of that. And now they're going, okay, maybe I am ready for the $500 offer. And so then now they can try that. And so it allows, you know, people to ease in. And you know what? Some people will show up and be like, wonderful, $5,000. I want to work with you personally. Let's go today. And that's great too, but your marketing systems are allowing people to, you know, enter into this world with you and whatever place works best for them. And you just kind of know without being a huge drain on your time that, uh, you know, people are, are making, it's a choose your own adventure marketing is what I call it. And so again, maximizing whatever people are ready for in terms of impact and income and, and, uh, anyway, th- th- there's a lot that could be said about setting prices and feeling confident with it. But I think if you've dialed in, in those four areas, it does a lot to help you confidently go, look, I've got my $25 offer. I've got my $25,000 offer. And I-, I feel good about the income and impact balance that I've, I've reached in my business. And, and probably with each one of those, they're getting more private access to you too. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah exactly. Awesome. Well, Jason, this was fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing all your wisdom with us in this limited time we had together. How can people reach you and get more from you? Um, So a great place where I talk about this stuff more is over on my blog at jasonvanorden.com. And then I've got uh, a download that you can get. So I've talked about these four areas in in your business that you can, you know, kind of help you hone in and upgrade incrementally your impact and income. And I did a webinar a little bit back where I went in more depth, you know, so over about an hour, I went more in depth in each of those four areas and how I apply that to my business and my clients' businesses. So if you'd like to get that as a download, the the recording of that webinar, you can go to jasonvanorden.com com forward slash multiply because it's all about multiplying your impact and your income. I love it. JasonVanOrden.com forward slash multiply. Great. Thank you so much, Jason. We really appreciate you being on the show. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, Linda. I loved uh, our chat together. Me too. That's all for today. Until next time, live the good life and be wealthy and smart. Thank you for listening to Be Wealthy and Smart with Linda P. Jones. Share the wealth and tell your family and friends about the show. Check out our website, blog, and social media for more riches at www.bewealthyandsmart.com.